G'day ladies and gentlemen, it's Troy McCubbin here with another podcast of Guitar Wank and <laughs> we are here with Bruce Foreman and Scott Henderson. If you haven't checked out our podcast, please do so. Go to the website guitarwank.com, our podcast Guitar Wank, our Twitter page, guess what, Guitar Wank and Penis, that's all I got. <laughs> well, here we go. <laughs> Let the wanks begin. The 71 is the, it's like the champagne great wine year yeah. for, for Marshall. It's the 70, 71. Actually, I take that back. 68 through 71 are the really primo ones. You know, they're all the same. There's a super bass and a super lead, and the, the difference between the two amps is just a couple five cent capacitors that you can switch out, you know right. what I mean, to make it either or. But um, yeah, they're just great amps. I mean, they just sound beautiful because they're, they're hand wired. And in 72, Marshall went to the circuit boards, and a circuit board amp can sound fine but the problem is is that back then the circuit boards were just cheap shit you know the traces on them were so thin that they were crap you know nowadays people are like john sir are making circuit boards and military grade circuit boards where there's traces on both sides and it's even thicker than a real piece of wire right. you know so nowadays circuit amps are, are, are fine but back then when Mar the first circuit boards came out they were like toasters <laughs> it's not like an amp yeah. you know you're running through ju all this juice through these tiny little traces on the circuit board and it just sounds like dog shit uh, it's horrible you know so have you, have you sorry not to make fun of your piece of shit amp oh, no, I, it's, it's, it's up there because it never gets used it's just a piece of fucking <laughs> art yeah it's just art I took, it to, I took it to Roy Blankenship and asked him can you make this any better and he's like <laughs> He said that's a piece of shit. Yeah, he basically. Yeah, he says that about everything, including the yeah, MC makes. Yeah, well, I got stuck with that many years ago. You just can't do anything about it except not use the preamp, and that's what I'm hoping to do. Just use the power amp of it. Isn't everyone just like you said? Everyone's just copying, rebuilding a great, trying to rebuild yeah, a great Yeah, but the Marshall. problem is, is they're trying to improve it, and you, 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 a lot of times when they try to improve it, they put a bunch of bells and whistles on it that just make it sound worse. Right. But to their minds they're giving you options but the problem is is that the options are not as good as just leaving it alone like it was yeah because the simpler the circuit the better it sounds yeah you know so when you start putting toggle switches on it and stuff like that and giving you giving the player options you lose the the purity of the tone going through the amp you just you can't do that they put all these extra shit on them it just takes the, it they start getting fancy things. just fucking hurts the tone like i don't know if you know this but even on a two channel amp that's why guys like one channel amps because if you have to split into two channels you have to run through a buffer right you cannot split a signal into two different channels without a buffer and buffers suck right so if you're playing a two channel amp that has channel switching you're gonna have you're running through a buffer you've already ruined your tone that's why everybody likes one channel amps because they just, you plug into the channel and that's what the amp gets is that one pure signal. Pure that's signal. why it sounds so good. Yep. You don't have the best chord sound because you have to compromise. Your chord sound's going to be a little dirty. It's not going to be completely clean, you know, but overall you get a better tone. Better tone. Yeah. Yeah. Simpler the circuit, the better the thing sounds. That's just a common fact about amps yeah just Amazing. good old fender with a few knobs on it you can't you can't beat that <laughs> they're amazing yeah. eddie uses a variac which really destroys the amp but he's rich enough to keep buying new ones yeah, you know right. but he did you know that's what? he is a variac so he turns down the voltage on the amp so the amps only getting 80 volts and the tubes get hot and they eventually kills the amp blows it up <laughs> but it sounds great if you can afford to do that, right. <laughs> it's like he doesn't even rebias them. He just 
lowers the voltage, you know, and then the tubes are like red hot and they're like melting out of the back of the. <laughs> and so he just keeps finding new ones. Or? I guess he just finds new amps and just it's just like know. he he doesn't you buy vintage ones. So he... I don't know what he does now. Now he's got companies making signature amps for him. Yeah. So I imagine he can just get a new amp anytime he wants, or maybe yeah. he found a sound that he doesn't have to. But in the old days, he used to just get a variac and just turn the fuck, crank it down to like 80 volts and the amps going <laughs> 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 it's like, but it sounds great man you know yeah that tone is awesome well on their last oh, album that's really what mark worked on the album with them and he was there yeah, he just they got yeah. all these modded these marshals and rebuilt them that his tone on van halen one and two are really good and then yeah. three it started to get kind of squirrely hmm. but on one and two man that's some good sounds yeah yeah those are pure marshals just cranked and hurting <laughs> <laughs> do you take the grill off do you have it right on the speaker when you're doing no something? no you don't want to do that because no. if it's too close to the speaker it gets fuzzy mm -hmm. you need a little air right the ambience of the room has to play a part in the sound otherwise all you hear is fizz right you know that's what i was saying when i when you guys were hearing that in the car my solo mm -hmm. it was a little fuzzy it's because the uh, the mic was too close to the cone right you know what yep. i mean it's I just it was just a recording mistake i should have just backed it off backed just it a little, little bit. bit more but i wasn't as meticulous because it wasn't my album it was some other guy's album <laughs> right <laughs> don't <see. laughs> <laughs> I'm more meticulous on my own records. Yeah, you know. we know you go to the Yeah, yeah to, you know. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, this sounds good and you know, whatever. But But I mean I heard that tone and I liked it. It's just It's just I hear the little bit of fizziness. I would have changed that. If I had to do it over, I would have done it a little differently. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean there's a place where you put the mic on the speaker is really about the room. Because you can't say there's a place to put it because in every room it's going to be different. Mm, okay. You know, it, 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 it's uh, every room has its sweet spot where the mic should be, you know, and it's different in every room. I have it nailed in my little room, but if I took my amp somewhere else, be different. I would have no idea where to put the mic. I would right. have to fuck around with it and try to figure it out. Is it like that for gigs with you, like when you're on tour? The gigs are the worst. Right. I mean, Bruce can tell you that. Even, even, you know, Bruce's thing is way easier than my thing because my, there's many more things that can fuck up mm. on, on my gear. Cause I've got more gear and I'm more reliant on my gear. Right. There's so many things that can get fucked up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the gigs where everything works exactly right. They're like one in 10. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I've, I've come to believe now that you know i can't expect to play my best every night because if the tone isn't good i'm probably not going to have a very good night musically because i'm not going to be inspired by my tone and i'm not going to play very well yeah i know that about myself and it's i live with it yeah you know well why would you if something is sounding off to your ears you want to play less like I don't want to play when it when it sounds like shit. I don't know. I play more. Like. I play more, and that's why it's fucked up. <laughs> okay, well, I play. That's less. that's where I go. If if yeah. the sound isn't working, I play more. Yeah, I play more because Cause, you're cause trying to cover general, it up. Well, generally, your sustain is not is happening. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. your tone's fucked up. Another is just it's not as pleasing to your ear. Right. So by playing more mass, you know, like like getting quicker to each new thing. Yeah. You don't have to live as long with the sound. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Guitar Wank with Bruce Foreman and Scott Henderson. I am Troy McCoven. If you aren't familiar with this podcast, you need to go to guitarwank.com. You can get all the fun, lovely, informative material there, plus merch. And uh, I believe you can buy Bruce and Scott's soul on the website. You guys are selling the souls there, so you can get them cheap. If you're not a sponsor, get in now because we are taking all sponsors because we have none. And uh, we are happy to uh, go down that road with you. So, The dirty channel on that is horrible. Horrible. Yeah. I don't mind the clean channel. Clean channel with pedals. That's what yeah. I do. 
it's, yeah. it's not it's it's usable well it's usable and I, I mean i can't tell you how many gigs i've done with them so yeah. of course it's usable yeah. but but you know compared to a real amp what you're using not, yeah that's not even in the same ballpark i mean you know it's not even in it's not even in the same universe because there's frequencies that just are are bad yeah and for me, it's not really about sustain or anything because I'm using gain. So, of course, I have sustain. It's about bad frequencies, things yep. that hurt your ears and make you just want to throw up. Yeah. It's like wine. Yeah. You know, anybody that knows what good wine is, when they taste bad wine, they're upset. And it's very hard to make yourself stupid about something you know about. <laughs> <laughs> I started no. drinking red, I two buck chuck. Yeah. For yeah. the longest time, I thought that was pretty good, and mm. then I got schooled in wine, and mm. that's like camel's piss now. You uh, just wouldn't do it. I would give anything if I could make myself stupid <laughs> about about things that I know a lot about. You know, because my life would be a lot better. You know, I've seen players, and I'm not going to mention any names, but I've seen professional players with the worst tone up there just grinning like everything is okay and playing the shit out of the guitar. <laughs> I've seen and I wish too. I could be like that, yeah. you know, but I can't be. We're well, just like, oh my I, God, I, it's horrible. I, it's a horrible tone, but the guy's playing his ass off. I like the notes, but it sounds like shit. Yeah. And he doesn't know it, you know, because he just doesn't know. Or he doesn't care. Or doesn't care. I've heard of some players growing up where they could play through anything and everything sounded great. But whether it's playing sounding great to them, it's not sounding great to right. them. It's sounding great to you because you're not hearing the way he hears. Right. Yeah. But every player that really is perceptive about tone has their good nights and bad nights where it sounds better to them than other nights. You know. Right. And a lot of that depends on the room. And of course, if you're not even playing your own gear, you're already been given a bad hand you know so you're already starting from under and <laughs> trying to work yourself back up to just being at a at a medium yeah you know yeah. and you know you're never going to reach anywhere the, the 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 tone that you get with your own gear yeah and you have to accept that and that's what makes it hard to be on the road when you're renting gear i'm not i'm sure not just for me but for any player that cares about oh, it's tone a, it's a nightmare and you're you're taken away from your gear and you have to <laughs> rent stuff that you don't like it's hard. It's yeah. hard because you're, you're every night you're facing somebody that's not, you're facing yourself knowing that you're not as good as you could be because, and you can't be because you're not going to be inspired the way you're inspired yeah. when you have your own sound. And it's even more so for someone like you guys, where you guys are up there as guitar players, where I'm doing like, you know, as a support musician, a hired right. gun. Right. And I know how that feels to me when I know I've got a shitty amp. You're just like, you're deflated yeah. before you even walk stage. Well, one of the things that's really fucked about my career is that I'm known for my tone. Yeah, you People are. look at me as a tone <clears throat> advisor. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, my tone is pretty good on my records and pretty good with my gear. And I've reached the point that when I'm playing with my own gear, I don't even think about tone anymore. Wow. I feel very natural and I feel very happy with my tone and all I concentrate on is music. Right. I'm not I don't have anything to fight. Nothing's in my way. Yeah. You know? But when I'm out on the road and playing rented gear, it's a battle. You know? It's a battle just to sound good. You know, fuck the music. The music doesn't even come into play. Right. You know what I mean? Just to get a note to sound good is such a struggle. How can I possibly be expected to play my best? You know, I just want to sound reasonably good. And that's hard enough. I have to pick exactly in some weird places. And I found, okay, I can't pick here because that's going to make that sound. <laughs> so I have to pick here. You know, it's just fucked, you know. <laughs> It's a fucked up thing. Yeah. But I'm, after years of doing it, I've come to grasp with it. And, and I know that I can't be too hard on myself because if I beat myself over not playing well, it's going to be about me. And it's not about me. It's about right. the gear. Yeah. I mean, of course, there are nights where I don't play well <laughs> and it's my fault. Right. <laughs> you know, but there are way more nights that I don't play well because I'm so fucking bummed out about my tone the tone yeah yeah and yeah. and and so that's why i don't beat myself up over it and and go around saying oh i suck i suck i suck 
because most of the time when I have my gear, it's like I come off stage feeling like, okay, if the audience dug it and, you know, maybe I didn't play the best I've ever played, but I played okay. You know what I mean? Normally I play okay. Yeah. You know, I, I sort of look at it as uh, out of 10 gigs, you know, I'll, I'll have one stellar, stellar gig, one horrible gig, <laughs> right? And the other eight will be just kind of, yeah, okay. You know, I played like it's like life, you know. Right. It's just another day. Nothing terrible happened. Nothing amazing happened. But <laughs> well, to like... provide another, as, another <laughs> perspective on that, uh, for me, almost the biggest... I mean, of course, I don't play to the, you know, to the level that he does. I don't have all the equipment involved in it. Well, you're a straight in guy. Right, right. So, I mean, I don't have, I don't have, you know, the pedals and stuff, and I don't play at the volume he plays and those things. So I'm asking a lot less of my equipment than he is. Hmm. And I know that. To me, the big thing is the room yeah. that I play in. Yeah. And there are rooms that I play in that no matter what I do, you know, a note just is not going to hang in the air. A note is not going to have a sweet sound. A note, you know, and there are times where it's the gear specific, but more I find myself fighting rooms than gear. Right. Even with rented gear, like usually I'll get a Fender Twin and I can make peace with that with what I do. I know. I like <laughs> I, it. I, I like that. <laughs> make I peace with I, it is a good way to look No, no. At. I mean, I can, I mean, really, if, if I can, can't get a good sound, it's my fault. Really. Right. You know, I right. mean, and, you know, I don't play at a super loud volume that really demands a lot of the amp. I don't process the sound, which doesn't demand a lot. You know, I mean, the, I, I really readily, I'm not saying anything like Scott is not, you know, I'm not disagreeing with Scott. No. I'm it's just, just saying way my it. way of what I need from that equipment is so less, you know, that it makes it that a lot of the equipment is going to work better for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I find that the biggest, like I say, the biggest factor in everything is the room and I can get in a good room and play like ramps I don't even like and be okay. Yeah. I can have my equipment in a horrible room and I'm still just, out of luck. It's just not going to feel good. But I also have this feeling about coming to grips with it because the important thing is serving the music for me. And while I totally agree with Scott, you know, there are nights where I can't just play at all. And there are nights where I, you know, am playing well beyond myself. And the rest of my life is in that middle ground, you know, what I mean? <laughs> uh, which is what it's all about. I, I also try to kind of look at it from this point. It's like, I have to love my sound. I just have to love it. Mm. I don't have to like it, but I have to love it. In other words, I have to come to grips with what I've got and take it in for this night, you know, when within the adjustment ranges that I have, and then get into the music. I, I just can't allow, whether it's the room or the amp or the drummer or the bass player, or the weird vibing people in the front row, to get in the way between me and the music. You know what? I totally agree. But I know I'm not saying I can do said it. Than done. That's exactly. <laughs> and that was that was going to be the next thing I was going to say, which is like that's my philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> now when too. the rub, when the rubber hits the road. <laughs> All bets are off. Right. Yeah. It's like, that's my philosophy too, but somehow it never works out. Yeah. Well, well I, I have this saying, I say, take my advice. I'm not using it. Right. That's exactly right. That's perfect. That's, that's so true. But it's true. Like, I'm sure you guys are the same. You, you have a setup in your home that's familiar and you dial it all in and you're like, this is just bitching. Yeah. And as soon as you get on that stage, oh, it man. all goes to shit. And well, you're they're, like, I've got the in, same settings. Everything's exactly the same. But therein lies the factor <laughs> is that the room itself is the huge... It's not just the guitar is 40 and the amp is 45 and the da-da-da-da and the room just happens to be. It's actually that the room is 50% of it easily, if not more. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And so for us to like dial it into our room, in our room and, and be doing that is almost an exercise in futility. I mean, it's great to do it 
to get a sound and to, to really find out what our equipment can do. Mm-hmm. But in terms of what it's functioning for us, if it's if it, if we're walking out of our room thinking realistically that we're going to get that sound everywhere we go, yeah, we deserve everything we get when we get on the bandstand. <laughs> yeah. Which leads me to one of my rants here, which is on Facebook. I can't tell you how many times I've seen guitar players with. Here I am, I'm playing in the Grand blah, 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 blah in Barcelona, you know, this unbelievable, like, or Carnegie Hall, or, yeah. you know, you see all this shit, right? These beautiful, like, these guys, these little selfies, they like self-selfies they take. <laughs> and, and, of course, they show their rig, and they show their view of the, aud- of, the <laughs> uh, of the hall, right? I'm guilty I of mean, this. we all do, right? <laughs> okay. okay, but meanwhile, this picture has, of course, it's empty, it's sound check, so yeah. there's no, it's just beautiful hall and you know it's got these amazing acoustics you know and and you look at the guitar player and he's got two amps and a big pedal board that's got three reverbs and two delays <laughs> on it and it's like what the fuck does that have to do with that hall <laughs> i mean if you're just do you mind i mean i already have an amplifier i know i'm already fucking with the hall okay you know what i mean if it, because it was really acoustic and using the hall and caring that you played in the grand palace to mulla 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 you know what i mean you, I'd be up there singing, or right. I'd be playing an acoustic guitar and letting that room do its magic to yeah. sound. Yeah, you know. But okay, I gotta play with the amplifier because my guitars guitars aren't loud enough, so I need some help with volume. But if I start adding delays and reverbs, and I'm playing in Carnegie Hall or the Grand Palais to <laughs> motherfuck, you know, I mean, come on, let's get real here. <laughs> Who are we fooling? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, you're going to create your little hall reverb bullshit wherever you are. And, you know, I mean, you might as well take a picture of the fucking bathroom at Grand Central Station. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> no, that's a good point, though. You know, you know well, I, I, see, I'm never, I've never taken a picture of anywhere I play. Aren't I you just, glad? I just play bars. <laughs> Here, I'm playing in this 100-seat uh, bar. And, and you know, I mean... <laughs> You know, so, I, mean, I don't play big enough places to be proud. But am I the only one that notices this dichotomy? You know, this <laughs> total like, wait a minute here. There's something wrong with this picture. No, but the room is such an incredible factor, and it's amazing that even when you do have your own gear, how incredibly bad it can, can sound, sound if right? you get in a really terrible room. Yeah. Luckily for for me, the gear is is actually more important than the room because if I have my own gear. A room is not going to affect me as much as bad gear will. Right, and plus yeah. you you know your gear well enough to dial it in to how it yeah, is. Yeah, I can change my gear to fit a room, you know, and I can right. change my setup and my ambience of my reverbs and delays and all that kind right. of stuff to fit a room. And it, you know, some rooms, of course, sound better than others, but when you've got bad gear, it doesn't matter about the room. <laughs> You're stuck with bad <laughs> gear, and yeah. then and then you got a problem. That's, and then, that's then you, we haven't even talked about yeah. sound. Sound reinforcement and sound persons. Oh, sound men. Don't get me started on those fucking idiots, man. <laughs> well, not I mean, all no, of them are. Some no, of them. but 99% of them are. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, but, but my point is there's a lot of variables here. What, and, and I guess back to my original point, which is better, of course, you know, easy to say, hard to do, but making peace with it and providing as much as you can to the music and to the audience. And regardless of the challenges that lay, whether it be the acoustics of the room, the bad salmon, the bad gear, somehow transcending that, just deciding you're going to transcend that and make it a good experience musically is, is, and I'm going to say again, easier said than done. Sounds like heaven. But (laughs) but it's our responsibility. It is our responsibility, you know, because those people came in, they paid the same money to see you play with a bad perception of yourself as they did to see you play with a good perception of Except yourself. Except for the guitar players that want to see you suck. Yeah. Which, is, yeah. you know, right. which, are, well, which a, are a lot yeah, of people. With, yeah, but the thing is, is that you really do owe the audience the best performance you can give. But that being said, even if you have a miserable time and you try your best, you're still giving the best you can give. Doesn't mean that you have to like it. You know, right, you're but doing it's still, the best and you're doing the you best got. you can with what you've got. And and you know, I've had people come up to me, friends and associates, and even people from the audience that have said, "Man, 
you really, really, really put your heart and soul into this performance. And I know I could tell from your face that you weren't having a good time. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you, you could see that you were struggling, that you didn't like your tone. I've seen you play before and I know that you weren't happy tonight, but I loved the music and I had a great time listening to you. And that like, okay, great. Then it's all good. Yeah. You know, but at least the guy knows that, that he's aware that musicians are just like anybody else. We're, yeah. we're not, we don't have a perfect time playing music every time we play. We, we have bad nights where things don't go our way. And, you know, you just try not to be too dark about it. You know, yeah. you know, you know famous guitar players who are known for being dark. And, <laughs> and I don't want to be known as one of those guys. Right. You know, the audience can see when, when, when you're dark. You know, so I try to have fun no matter what and try to have a good time no matter what. And but that's all I can do. I can't magically make the night better when when I'm having a problem thinking of any notes to play because every note that comes out sounds like shit to me. (laughs) You know, it's like someone yelling shit in your ear and expect you to recite poetry at the same time. Right. (laughs) It's it's pretty hard to do. Yeah, that's that's. (laughs) Let's try it. You know, shit, man. Right. <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's true. It really is hard because because some and I read a that book, you know, Kenny Werner, Effortless Mastery. You know about that book? No. It's a good no. book. Yeah. Yeah, you you've read that book? Of course, and I know I've worked with Kenny. I know Kenny. Yeah. And it's a nice book. I mean, I would I, some things he says I don't agree with, like, you know, he he tells everybody they should think of themselves as a master all the time and I think of myself as a master when I think about my dogs but right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we don't need to get into that here that's, that's about, another podcast that's about it <laughs> but, but but you know what what he's basically saying is you know one of the things he says is that you have to hit a note on the piano you know and think of it as the most beautiful note you've ever heard that's where you start Right. And I'm going, well, that must be nice being Kenny Werner and playing on a nice, you know, perfectly tuned grand piano every time you do a show. You know, (laughs) try playing a fucking Marshall DSL and see see if you can say that. You know, you know, (laughs) next time you come over, that DSL will be down. Down hiding down there, and I'll just have something else. But it else doesn't up there. say it's a DSL. It has some other letters on it. Uh, it's a DSL. It's a JCM two thousand DSL. DSL head. Oh, yeah. yeah. And and what uh, does DSL stand for? Uh, dual super lead, is it? Uh, dual super lead, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so so <laughs> that means nothing to me. That's, yeah, that's, you, know, you want to see what explain that in English? To me either. I've been using the amp for a long time. You want to explain I don't that know in English? Either. That's wow. That's the amp. That's the amp you can get on the road. That's all you can get. Basically, the only two decent amps you can get on the road rental is the 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 JCM two thousand right DSL or a Fender Blues Deville. Yeah, or a Blues Deluxe, Deluxe or, or a Blues get, Deluxe. If yeah. you're playing a little gig, you can get a Blues right. Deluxe. That's yeah. what I got on the road all the time with yeah. those. And I've got same. a Blues right. Deluxe. That's actually the Hot fine. Rod Deluxe, yeah. right? Or hot Rod Deluxe. Deluxe. Hot Rod Deluxe. Blues, hot Blues rod the only Deluxe. difference is they have one's tweed. Oh, one's no, one. it's a Hot Rod DeVille. Okay. Hot Rod DeVille. Yeah, the, so the either, black ones are the yeah. Hot Rod and the blue yeah. and yeah. the tweed are the blues. Yeah. But they, so, they were always pretty consistent. They're consistent. They yeah. sound fine. The only thing that, that doesn't sound that great is the speakers are the cheap speakers that they put in them. You know, I have a Deluxe. And and uh, you know Hot Rod Deluxe, and I put a good Celestion sixty five in it, yep. and just vastly improves the tone wow. of the amp, and it sounds really good. Yeah. And um, yeah, I in fact when I was playing a tour when Dennis Chambers couldn't make a tour, I played a tour with Mike Clark mm-hmm. and and Jeff Berlin, and Mike Clark plays really soft, so of course I'm not going to bring a Marshall in a four twelve <laughs> cabinet, you know. So I went on the road with the Fender. Deluxe. I just I just UPSed it to New York, right. and we traveled around with it in the van. And my my deluxe was killer. And a lot of the people in the audience were saying how good my tone was, and that they've seen me play with my Sir amp and everything. And they said through the PA, you're you're you know I didn't notice anything bad. Like the tone wow. was really killer. Yep. And I was like, wow, yeah, this deluxe is really kicking ass. But I did change the speaker. That was the main so, factor. Didn't Landau? Doesn't he do? Didn't he he do does. That? Yeah, he rents those. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, the the problem is is that I play a lot of pretty big rooms, 
and I need a hundred watts for the clean sound yeah. to get to get what enough. Are I using two of them? Sound. I could, yeah, I could. That's a possibility. But I mean, here's the difference between the two. What big difference between the two of us? I've played with Mark Clark since 1972. You know, I've known him really a long time. We're both from the Bay Area. I'm yep. Assume. And I've never heard anybody refer to Mike Clark as a soft drummer. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. Because no. yeah, no, really, I'm used to playing know, with Dennis every, Chambers. Every, so. I know everybody <laughs> I've ever played with. You know, the first the mic is loud. You know, right? I mean, I love it. You know, I I like what I would call loud drummers, he would call soft drummers. You know, Elvin Jones, I loved. You know, I loved Art Blakey. I, I, if Smitty Smith is in my band. Yeah. Uh, but he's you know, medium. I play with Mike. Don't you think Smitty's a medium? Yeah, but he's, Mike yeah. is that loud. No, not anymore. Well, no, he Mike, was. You know what? When you, <laughs> when you played with Mike, he was playing a lot louder. Oh, okay. Now he's playing only straight ahead, and he's really playing soft. I oh, mean, okay. He, much softer. It'll be great to play with him again. Yeah. You know, I no, just he, saw him two weeks, three he, weeks ago. He plays softer now, and he still plays great, of course. But he's just volumed it down. In fact, he he want he didn't even want to be in between me and Jeff on stage. Yeah, and we were playing soft. Yep. And he likes to be on the side of the stage, like a lot of drummers like to be on the side of the stage because they don't want to be sandwiched between two of the musicians because it's too loud for them. Yeah. And they like to be on the side because they hear more space, you know, yeah. and they can, they don't have to play as loud to keep up, you know, so, but I love playing with Mike. I mean, he's a great, oh, he's man, what awesome a great, drummer. Great man. drummer. Just great. I like, you know, I mean, I prefer the bass in the middle just so, you know, I can hear it better. And of course we play a million times softer than you guys. So, and it's a upright bass, not an acoustic bass, right. and not a electric, electric bass. And so the presence factor is way different. Sure. We just like to take this short break to say thank you. Thank you. Guitar Wank Podcasts with Bruce Foreman, Scott Henderson. And the other guy. all your other stuff but that blues album just sticks in my head because your tone was so monster on that that's just a matchless yeah that's a matchless, that's what it was, and, a, matchless. matchless and a tube screamer wow <laughs> it's that's... easy it's easy to get good tone out of those kind of things because you just plug in and just play it's yeah it's yeah. not it's i mean certain part of it is in your fingers of course but you know that's that's kind of uh, an easy tone to get because it's not high gain Right. The more gain you put on, the harder it is to make it sound good. Mm -hmm. High gain is the hardest tone to to achieve to, achieve, yeah. to make it sound smooth and non fuzzy, but still. Because see, when I play guitar, I'm thinking that I'm a horn player. Right. You know, I'm thinking saxophone when I play guitar, and and to make it sound smooth like a saxophone, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. It just it's just amazing how much can go wrong you know <laughs> yeah. so yeah. you gotta kind of a lot of stuff a lot of stuff it would take up a whole podcast just to talk about all the stuff you have to do to to, to get a tone like that and make it sustain yet not be fuzzy and rock rock and roll sounding right right, right? It's a whole other thing. It's almost like that violin kind of tone. A violin type of thing, like, like Alan Johnson. Holsworth does, or Eric Johnson, or, or even Schofield to a certain yeah. extent. You know, he doesn't play with a lot of gain, but he's got that real smooth, sweet sound that sustains, like a horn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
and that's you know that's what guys like me go after. Yeah. Much easier to get a rock and roll tone because you can just turn the amp up and scream, and you know all the fizz and hair that comes on top of the notes is part of rock and roll. It's what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a, a different. It's kind of a different, whole different style yeah. from the electric guitar. Now jazz guitar, when you when you go for a tone, are you thinking along those lines? As in. The violin, or are you yeah, thinking yes. more like a piano player? No, 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 very much. I'm kind of stuck in a, in a different kind of middle. I mean, first of all, it's a guitar. And I do love the guitar. Mm-hmm. Even though I think like a piano player and a horn player, I feel, I love the guitar. Right. And my my problem with jazz guitar uh, oftentimes is it's is, is so muffly. Because mm. guitar players want to get a fat sound. And out of a hollow body guitar, oftentimes the way to do it, because the high notes get thin and the low notes get boomy, because it's got a lot of frequency, you know, acoustic frequency it's putting out, particularly if we use heavy strings, they just kind of like pump the bass in mid-range and roll off the treble to get fatness. Right. And uh, to me, that loses part of the beauty of the guitar. Yeah. The clear, I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, I'll hear a, some jazz guitarists with their tone, and literally the high E string on the guitar sounds lower in pitch <laughs> than the bass string's D string. And there are times, you know, right. in tone quality. Yeah. I mean, not yeah. pitch, tone quality. And so for me, I do think very much like a horn, and I want that same thing that he's talking about, but I have a, another problem to deal with which is I play a lot of complex chords and a lot of voice leading and a lot of things that move. And with that much gain and any sort of driving of the amp, that becomes mud. Right. You know, and I do like some distortion when I get hot. I don't want, I don't want it to be clean because, believe me, if I were clean and played as hard as I played, it would hurt my ears and everybody else's. It would be like ice picks. But I do fill up a lot of sound, and yet I play chords that have a lot of notes in them. And if they get too thick, then it just sounds like a house is falling over. It, right. You know, all I get is the texture of, of energy. I don't get the harmonic value. Mm. So yep. the pianistic side that I go for, you know, and the inner voices and the chord soloing and stuff, it's a real weird dance that I'm in. I want a fat enough sound to where the high notes are clear but creamy and sustaining, and yet I can still play intricate harmonic stuff all the way down to the bottom and have it not be like a bunch of bricks falling over, you know? And so I have to give up certain things. And some of the stuff I have to give up to get that is that horn sort of ability to soar right. at times. Yeah. Does it, it make yeah. sense? But then again, you know, and it's something I really want to have, you know, because my main influences are Bird and, you know, and Cannibal Ireland and John Coltrane and... Hank Mobley, but I also am deeply, you know, influenced by Winton Kelly and Herbie Hancock and McCoy Tyner, and you know what I mean? So it's like, I'm just sort of finding, you know, and every day it's a little bit one way or another. Mm. My yep. tone is I have changing. to say, though, when I go to hear Bruce, and and here's some here's the first ass kissing on the podcast. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, shall I pull my pants down? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay. But but you know when I, when I hear him play, you know there's there, he's got that balance. You know that and and I, I you know not many people maybe know this about me, but I really love jazz guitar. Right. I love it. I don't do it, but doesn't mean I don't love it. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things why me and Bruce are friends because. Bruce is a jazz guitarist, but he loves Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. You know, he sees the value in any good music. You know, most people would think that, oh, you know, Scott Henderson, he doesn't listen to Wes Montgomery, but I do listen to Wes Montgomery. I listen to Pat Metheny. I listen to to hollow body guys play jazz. You know, I love it. And when I hear Bruce play, he's one of the few guys, and I don't mean to belittle anybody, but he's one of the few guys that really seems super conscious about tone Hmm. where a lot of the jazz guys play. I can go there and really dig the notes, but I always wish that things were clearer and easier to hear. You know, sometimes the chords are so muddy. I can't hear what the voicing is. A lot of jazz guys, guitar tones seem to be very, just not 
dynamic enough. Well, it's it, for me, it's more about the color of the sound of the chords. Yeah. The single notes I never have a problem with, other than sometimes when they get down into the low register, there's more bass on the guitar than there is on the bass. Yeah. And I'm going, well, those low notes you're playing are drowning out the bass guitar. <laughs> you know, it just it just too too, too boomy. Yeah. You know. And and that also affects the chords. When you play a chord, it's just mud, you know? And it's not distorted because it's distorted. It's distorted because there's no treble. There's no high end. Yeah. It's just all low frequencies. It's like someone just turned up a hundred hertz way too far. <laughs> right. You know? And and when I hear Bruce play you can hear every single note of yeah. every single chord, all the voice leading and everything that's important for you to hear, you can hear it. You know, it's really, really sparkly and nice without being ever cutting or, or hurt your ears. It's just a, he really knows how to get good tone. And like I say, it's in the fingers, but it's also in the gear he chooses to play through and the way he sets his knobs. And you can tell that that he spent a lot of time dialing in a tone. Yeah. You know, that's really musical and listenable to to even to somebody to a housewife who knows nothing about <laughs> Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. You you go here and you're going to go, "Well, that's a nice tone, no matter if you're a musician or not." You know, and that's 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 one thing about musicians in general. When you hear somebody that really makes his instrument sound great, you want to listen to him. Yeah. Do, it doesn't matter if you know anything about music or not. Your ears are attracted to this beautiful sound that you hear, you know, and it has very, doesn't have anything to do with notes. No. It has to do with just the colors and the sounds that you hear in your ears makes you want to keep listening. And if, that's what I hear when I hear players like Bruce and, you know, Pat Metheny is another example. Of, he gets a really nice tone. It's one of the things that maybe made Pat Metheny famous is that I would people, say you would you definitely I would say he it made, came out it with makes, his own voice I would you know? say it makes everybody famous I think when you really Eric Johnson when you, like, when he you, stood out like that when you time. really pull it down you know pull the pull the pants down or pull the sheets down <laughs> what you see in in music is like I mean if we think about I mean jazz guitar who are the famous guys obviously Pat obviously John Schofield Bill Frizzell mm-hmm these guys are the, the, the considered top guys now of the genre. What do they have in common? Of course they're brilliant players, but you know, I mean, you go down the list to a hundred, everybody's a brilliant player. Yeah. yeah. It's like those three guys have a sonic signature that's so unique and so beautiful. Yeah. That, you know, and that's what makes someone like Scott or Jeff Beck you know, so important musically is that it's really, when you reduce it, it's not notes and rhythms. It's sound and feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's more that than the other. Right. I think it's more that than the other. But as guitar players, we definitely get, we, we lose sight of that. a lot. We of often times. do. And then there's do, other yeah. guys who go too deep on the other side and don't take care of business. With yeah. the notes and the rhythms, yeah. you know, and basically they'll spend all day at Guitar Center buying new shit. Yeah, you know <laughs> what I mean. Thinking rather than practice, rather. Than but the ones it. like you know, if you know, when you ask me, like, would you rather hear like, okay, take somebody like Bonnie Raitt, who gets a great tone, you know, she's not like a monster player, but she plays tastefully and really nice, and plays nice ideas, and has a great tone. I'd rather her, hear her play than most of the guys that play lots of notes with a bad tone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who have like more chops but don't have a tone. I'd rather hear Bonnie. Yeah. You know, just because I like the sound of her guitar. It, it, it's That's what it's like for me. And, and like the mixes and the way her albums sound and the, they're, they're such great classy engineer yeah it, they're so well put together her records you know they sound so good that we often use them as an example when we're mixing like okay is the bass too loud is the drums too loud let's listen to bonnie ray right. <laughs> you know yeah, and right. it's a good way to test how you're doing in your mix by putting on one of her records because they sound so damn good yeah you know and uh yeah, you know, just like for me, the, the tone is such a big, important part of it. And I think that's probably why, like as a kid, I was so attracted by Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, because both those guitar players have a total voice, distinctive yeah. voice. 
and so did Hendrix and so did Beck. And then if you get into the jazz thing, so did Wes. You know, when you think about these, it, they all do, don't they? They all have a super signature sound, a, a, Robin beautiful, yeah, Robin a beautiful, yeah, beautiful voice beautiful. that's their own, their own thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that's what really kind of attracts a lot of people to the music. <clears throat> okay, so that was average, that So was, my tone's <laughs> been sucking lately. So let's talk about something. Okay, okay. That was advertising. That was, that that was, that was the bad. advertising moment right there. Yeah. That pause. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you know what was really funny, man. Just to put this out there is the other night I played at Alva's, and it's a dry room. Right. And I brought an open back cabinet to the gig, and the gig would have been a lot better if I had brought a closed back cabinet. Right. Because the the closed back cabinet has ambience inside it, right. you know. So that ambience that's rolling around in that cabinet diffuses the notes so that they run into each other and they cross over each other in a more musical way. Where is with an open back cabinet, everything, all the notes are separated, you know. Oh, wow. And there's okay. this fizz in between the notes that you wouldn't notice in a wetter room, but in a dry room, you kind of notice it, you know. So basically a closed back cabinet is a wetter sounding cabinet than an open back cabinet. Right? right. So playing an open back cabinet in a seriously dry room, usually you're not going to be too happy. And I wish I, in hindsight, I wish I had a brought a closed cabinet to that gig because they were videotaping it. <laughs> it was like, God damn it. <laughs> not the right choice, you know, but, yeah, you know, we all fuck up. That was a huge fuck up on my part. Well, a lot of guys probably wouldn't even think. Well, I, yeah, I wouldn't have thought thought of that. I, That's something I didn't. One of those know. things. I just didn't didn't realize the room was going to be so dry. Right. Because it's just paneling everywhere, acoustic paneling everywhere. So, so next time I play there, I'll know. I'll bring a closed back cabinet and I'll have a better gig. Yeah. That makes a huge difference. It, Oh my God, the difference between an open back cabinet and a, and a closed back cabinet's another world. Right. Scott, who have you got this week? I would like to mention Kirk Fletcher. He's a blues guitarist. Mm hmm and a really advanced blues guitarist because he doesn't just play blues. He can play a lot of different styles, but blues is his forte. And like Stevie Ray Vaughan, I mean, he doesn't sound anything like Stevie Ray Vaughan, but like Stevie Ray Vaughan, he's like a real musician's blues player because he has all the technique that uh, and chops that a lot of the rock and jazz guitar players have, you know, that he's got really, you know serious chops right. but also all that incredible tone and feel of a great blues musician of the blues musicians you know that came before him i think he's probably influenced by albert king which yeah. a lot of us are you know and uh but he he has his own voice and he's just kind of built on that vocabulary with his own thing and he's really good i would great player. second that i think kirk is great and he's what i really like about him is you hear so much of a steep tradition in him and yet at the same time a very individual voice with it uh, where's where's he from he's from here he was i think he's from compton actually oh wow and he just moved to switzerland actually so you know he could play more in europe yep probably a god over there he i'm sure he tours <laughs> quite a bit over in europe yeah yep. awesome all right all right that's another great show i uh, hope you guys are enjoying it we'd love your feedback uh email these guys and just piss them off scott thank you as always you new said you wanted some feedback <laughs> new guitar tones by scott henderson and bruce always a pleasure it's it, boy if you think that's a pleasure i feel sorry for you 